Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Go to the Source Kentucky Parent Survey webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Tuesday, July 9th, 2013. I will now to turn the conference over to Sarah Walsh, Knowledge Officer. Please go ahead. Hi everyone, this is Sarah. I'm with the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky. And I apologize I don't have a guest speaker for you all today. You're stuck with just me on this one. But I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about our Kentucky Parent Survey. Uh, before we get going too far into the information about that survey, I always like to start with a little bit about the Go to the Source series and just kind of give you some context for what it is we're trying to do here. And I apologize if you've heard my spiel before, but for the past couple of years, the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky has offered workshops and webinars to support the work of emerging and established health coalitions and nonprofit organizations who are doing the important work of promoting health and advancing health policy in the Commonwealth. This year we wanted to expand that effort to specifically address the needs of data users. So if you are a researcher or an epidemiologist, if you're writing grants for your organization, if your health department is going through the MAP process, if your hospital is trying to put together a community benefit plan, um, whoever you are, if you are interested in health data, then Go to the Source was really intended for you. And I don't go anywhere without a shameless plug for Kentucky Health Facts. Uh, KentuckyHealthFacts.org is a website that was sponsored by the Foundation and launched in 2008. This site is designed to provide anybody, uh, both data pros, pros and just real novice users alike, with an overview of the health needs and the resources for their community. But let's be honest, sometimes you've got to dig deeper. Um, it is a cursory overview by design. We want it to be really accessible on Kentucky Health Facts. But if you want to kind of get really wonky and deep into the weeds, then we want to help you do that as well. So that's what Go to the Source was created for. And just to give you a little bit of context where we are in the series, uh, we've already had a few webinars. We started this series back in April. Uh, we talked about Health Landscape, which is a web-based mapping system and is a lot more user-friendly and accessible than something like an ArcGIS. So we think that's a great free tool that's available. Uh, later that month, Sarah Jeannie Knotra told us about the Kentucky Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System and some of the latest and greatest things that are happening with Kentucky Burfist. Uh, Michael Childress from the University of Kentucky shared with us information on the Kentucky Medicaid Pharmaceutical Utilization Guide, which is kind of a compendium of information on how medications are being prescribed to the Medicaid population that looked at a decade's worth of data to really drill down into um, that information by county and by race and by age, and it was, there's a lot of information there. Then, oh, I lost my mouse. There we go. Uh, in May, we talked about the Kentucky Health Issues Poll, which is another polling effort that is sponsored by our foundation in conjunction with the Health Foundation of Greater Cincinnati, and the OASIS Data Archive, which is a website that if you wanted to run your own statistical analysis, we make all of the KHIP data publicly available through that website so people can go and download the information or actually even run statistics right from that website, so it's pretty cool. Last month, Michael Price told us a little bit more about the Kentucky State Data Center and some exciting changes they've had going on there. Um, they are a really great educational opportunity, uh, resource for folks to get a handle on census data and labor, and labor statistics data and the American Community Survey and really how to find out more about population information for your community. That brings us to today. We're going to talk about the parent survey. And next Tuesday, we will have the last uh, webinar in this series. Amy Swan from Kentucky Youth Advocates is going to show us around the newly launched Kids Count Data Center, uh, which is part of the Annie E. Casey Foundation's Kids Count Project, 
where you can get county level health statistics and education statistics and quality of life and family and well-being statistics and almost anything you'd want to know about Kentucky's kids you can get from Kids Count. And they've just redesigned the way that that tool works so it's hopefully more user friendly and just a lot more um, accessible of a tool. So we're excited to take a look and learn more about that. But without kind of further ado, we're here today to talk about the Kentucky Parent Survey. So I, oh goodness, that got bigger. Um, I don't know how to use my toys, so bear with me as I talk to my computer. Uh, we're here to talk about the Kentucky Parent Survey. This is a new initiative that the foundation has sponsored. And very briefly, for the next hour, this is my kind of agenda. I want to share a little bit about the overall goals of the parent survey, how we conducted it, highlight a couple of the key findings, um, and let you know how you can learn more and how you can influence the design of the survey in the future. Um, as you may know or may not know, in 2011, the foundation launched a new strategic plan with two primary initiatives. The first of those initiatives is called Promoting Responsive Health Policy. And one of the things we're trying to do with that initiative is to help policymakers make informed decisions about health policy. So while we don't lobby as an organization, we do try to be a source of credible health data and targeted research for policymakers. Our second initiative is called Investing in Kentucky's Future. And through this initiative, we're really trying to make a concerted effort to improve the health of children in the Commonwealth. Uh, particularly in the areas of chronic disease prevention. And the Kentucky Parent Survey kind of becomes a bridge between those two initiatives. Through this survey, we're aiming to provide credible research about children's health issues. The first iteration of the Parent Survey was conducted for us last summer by the Center for Survey Research at the University of Virginia. We interviewed more than 1,000 parents and guardians of children under 18 years old from across the state. Uh, based on this sample size, we know the statewide estimates are accurate to plus or minus 3%, so it's a pretty narrow margin of error. And when we look at the data, obviously, for smaller demographic groups, say parents of very young children instead of all parents, the margin of error does get a little bit bigger, so just kind of bear that in mind if we look at any, as we look at um, kind of the breakdowns of the data. The weighting of the data, once we got that sample, we did weight it to better reflect the total population of Kentucky parents by age, race, gender, and phone type. So you can see that moms were a little bit more likely to answer our questions than dads. Uh, we have more female respondents than males. And we did try to adjust for that in the data. Waiting on phone status was also done to adjust for an undersample of cell phones. We know that there's an in increasingly um, Kentucky families are giving up their landline telephones and are relying exclusively on cell phones. So we want to make sure that we include a, lot, a large sample of cell phone users in all of our surveys. And we, can't, we, under, we didn't quite hit the mark of, of how many cell phone users we were hoping to get. So we did need to wait on that factor as well. And we did that to ensure representation of residents who may only use cell phones. Um, but it's more expensive to sample cell phones, and it's a little bit more difficult to get people to answer their cell phones. So um, that is just kind of a limitation that we have to be mindful of and, and work around. A little bit more about the participant demographics. We talked to folks from around the state. These five regions that we've, I have highlighted on the screen for you are the same five regions we use with our Kentucky Health Issues Poll, and they're based around area development districts. So the Louisville area is what we call the KIPTA Area Development District. The Lexington area is actually the Bluegrass Ad. Northern Kentucky is obviously the Northern Kentucky Ad District. And those three um, high population centers were able to focus to um, extract data at the Ad District level. For the remaining ad districts, we have to kind of cluster them together. So we have a large region of western Kentucky counties and a fairly large region of eastern Kentucky counties that we put together. Um, in all these cases, these are still very small sample sizes. When you start talking about only 200 residents or so, 
um, you need to be kind of careful with that data. So we, we didn't do a lot of reporting on this, but it is um, an analysis that, that is available. A little bit more about who answered the phone. This is a fairly educated, well-educated sample. Um, this is just information and all of this didn't factor into the waiting process. And it was a fairly affluent sample. Um, most of our respondents earned their family household income was greater than 200% of the federal poverty level. We also asked our parents to assess their overall health status. This is a pretty common question you see on a lot of health surveys. It's common on the BRFIS survey. Um, we say, in general, how would you rate your overall health status? And as you can see, just over half of parents described their health as excellent or very good. Um, that's the kind of teal and dark green areas on the left of the pie chart. We also asked parents to tell us a little bit about their kids. And for some of our questions, we asked about a specific child. And if you had multiple children, the way we dealt with that is we would ask which of your children had the most recent birthday. And that was the child that we asked you to refer to um, so that you weren't playing favorites. We picked one randomly for you. Um, we ended up with just a few more sons than daughters, and about one in three or three in ten parents reported that their child lived with them less than all of the time. They either had partial custody or the child did not live with them at all. Um, they just saw the child periodically. We asked the same question about the child's health that we asked about the parent's health. We said um, we asked them to rate their child's health on the same scale. And so whereas only slightly more than half of parents would describe their own health as excellent or very good, nearly 9 in 10 indicated that their child was in excellent or very good health. So that's a good thing for Kentucky's children and kind of a probably a troubling thing for Kentucky's grown-ups. So that's just kind of who we talked to, but what is it that we learned from those parents um, is what I want to talk about next. What did we learn? One of the questions we asked, um, actually a lot of the questions we asked pertain to childhood obesity. Obviously that is um, a significant health issue here in Kentucky and across the nation, so I'm going to focus on that a little bit. And that's just where we'll get started here. Um, I suspect if you're on this call, you, you get that, that you understand that childhood obesity is a serious issue in Kentucky. Um, we actually did some polling about this through our Kentucky Health Issues poll of all adults, and most people in the state do believe that childhood obesity is a, a problem in Kentucky. So that perception isn't necessarily limited to data wonks and public health professionals or anything like that. That's, that's out there. Um, but what was surprising is that um, what you may be able to ascertain from these pie charts is that parents don't really see the, inf the, the issue in, when it's in front of them. The pie chart on the right is data from the 2007 National Survey of Children's Health. That's the most recent iteration of the National Survey of Children's Health for which the data is available. And they found that nearly 4 in 10 Kentucky children are overweight or obese. 37% of Kentucky's children are overweight or obese. That's what this is showing you over here. So that's a, that's a pretty big problem. And that's 58% um, they said we're at a healthy body weight, and just 5% would be classified as underweight. And that's based on a BMI calculation that includes factors in their health, height, and gender. Um, when we asked parents about their own child, that's what's over here on the left, more than three in four parents thought their child weighed about the right amount. So just 14% thought their child weighed too much, and I don't think you have to be an epidemiologist to figure out that 14% is quite a bit different than 37%. So there's, there's definitely a disconnect between um, what researchers are measuring and what parents are seeing and reporting. We also asked the parents if their child's health care provider had ever told them that their child was overweight or obese. Um, just 4%, 4%, 4%, I can't get my head around this, of parents said their health provider had told them this. So 
we can't know from that data if the problem is that providers aren't talking about childhood obesity with parents or if parents aren't hearing it, um, you know, they just are not receiving that message from the providers. But there is definitely a disconnect um, and something is wrong with our communication because 4% is 4% is well short of 37% of children who are actually at an unhealthy body weight. So that was kind of alarming. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is sort of some of the things, factors related to childhood obesity. We looked at healthy eating and physical activity. We'll start with healthy eating. Um, we asked about healthy eating both at home and at school. This, this slide pertains to schools. And when we said, how important do you think it is that meals offered in your school or, or in your child's school or daycare if the child was very young meet a minimum standard for nutritional value? The vast majority of parents, nearly 9 in 10, thought it was very important that nutritious meals be served at schools. Um, but then we asked parents to actually describe the lunches served in the school their child attends. And only about one in four said the meals served at their child's school were in fact very nutritious. So this is something that parents are concerned about and value as important, but we're just not coming through apparently in the meals we're serving at schools. Then we asked about um, treats served in the schools. Um, a lot of advocates are trying to decrease the amount of cupcake and pizza parties that are used uh, to celebrate birthdays and holidays at school or student achievements or wrapping paper sales or, or whatever else they're doing at various schools around the state. Um, but this issue didn't really seem to phase parents. Uh, nearly 8 in 10, the 78% you see at the bottom, said that the right amount of treats were served at their child's classroom. Um, only 11% thought they were served too often, although this does include the 1% of respondents who volunteered treats should not be offered at all. This wasn't one of the multiple choice options we gave the parents. Um, that's not something the interviewer read to them. They came up with that on their own. So there are some parents um, who are concerned about this issue, but obviously uh, it, it's a pretty small number with just 11%. We also asked about physical activity in the schools. Um, physical activity at home and physical activity between school and home. Because um, obviously healthy eating is just one aspect of the puzzle. We asked parents if any of the kids in their household attended a school that was located less than one mile from their home, which is generally kind of considered a walkable distance. And about one in four parents did um, report that their child went to a school within a mile. Uh, the others attended school that were f schools that were further away or their child wasn't yet in school, obviously. Interestingly, only 7% of parents said their child ever walked or biked to school. Um, so there's definitely, again, a disconnect there that theoretically this would be a walkable distance and we don't know if the problem is there's no infrastructure and sidewalks or safe places for that child to walk, if the parent is worried and doesn't want them to walk because they're con they have safety concerns, or if they just, um, the children are required to ride the bus, or if the parents just aren't encouraging walking. But there's, there's an opportunity for more physical activity there for a lot of kids, um, it would seem. To dig a little bit deeper into that, we also asked parents some questions using the 5210 model as our guide. Um, if you're not familiar with 5210, this is a health promotion strategy designed to reduce childhood obesity in Kentucky. And it's been used in other states as well. Um, the numbers correspond to the recommendation that each day children should eat five or more servings of fruits and vegetables, watch no more than two hours of screen time or time spent watching television, movies, playing games, serving the internet, um, otherwise looking at some sort of device to do something other than their homework. And the one stands for the recommendation that children should get at least one hour of physical activity per day. And kids should consume, could, kids should consume zero sugar-sweetened beverages per day. That should be just a special occasion thing for, for kids to have a sweetened beverage like that. So we 
we asked parents a little bit more about these kind of factors. Notably, we didn't ask parents how many servings of fruit and vegetables their child ate in the past week um, because we weren't sure that they'd be able to tell us with very much precision. So instead of saying how many servings, because people get kind of confused, and is a half banana a serving? What if it was a large banana? Is it a whole banana is one serving of fruit? It's, it's very confusing. And certainly how many did you put in your child's lunch versus how many did your child put in their tummy is sometimes a, a different thing. Um, so we asked parents how often during the past week had their child gotten enough fruits and vegetables. And just over half of parents said that their child got enough fruits and vegetables every day, or seven out of the past seven days. About one in four parents said their child was getting enough half the time or less, somewhere between you know, one in four days during the past week. And 4% of moms and dads said their child didn't get enough fruits and vegetables on any days during the preceding week. So that's certainly um, cause for concern when that's an issue. We also asked parents on an average day about how many hours their child spent playing video games or on the computer, and we asked how many hours did they watch TV videos or DVDs. We were able to average that or add that together to um, create a combined score for screen time, and we saw that more than half of children were watching more than the recommended amount of screen time on a typical day. So 56% of kids are watching more screen time than the experts recommend they should. Uh, the next question in this batch related to physical activity, and it was framed the same way as the question about fruits and vegetables. In the past week, how often did your child get enough physical activity? Two out of three parents said their child got enough activity every day. Um, unfortunately, we don't know if these parents, if their view of quote unquote enough corresponds with the one hour recommendation from 5210, but it does provide us some insight into parents' levels of concern about physical activity. And two, to th two out of three parents probably wouldn't be too fussed about the amount of physical activity their child is getting because they think they get enough right now. 17% said their child got enough activity on just one to four days during the preceding week. And only 2% of parents didn't think their child got enough physical activity on any days during the preceding week. So in general, overall, it seems like parents really don't perceive their kids as sedentary. When we asked about sodas and sugar-sweetened drinks, um, we asked on an average day how many glasses or cans of soda, such as Coke or Sprite, or other sweetened drinks, such as fruit punch or sunny delight, does this child drink? Sorry for reading that at you, but wanted to get it accurate. Um, about four in 10 parents said their child typically had no sugar sweetened drinks, uh, which is certainly the recommendation. But most parents said their child had at least some, including the 27% of parents who said their child had two or more glasses or cans of soda per day. So that, that is a lot of sugar going into our kids right there. Kind of getting away from strictly talking about obesity, we got into some questions related to parent-child interactions. Um, we asked a number of questions about how um, folks interacted with their child and how they learned to be a good parent. Because obviously that's a thing that you would want to do as a parent. Um, about one in three parents said they had never, or they had ever attended a child care class, excuse me. So one in three have attended a child class, two out of three did not attend a child care class. Um, that taught skills for caring, about caring for a child or raising a child. Um, in the question frame, we specifically excluded things like childbirth preparation classes or Lamaze, um, just to make sure we were really talking about um, what comes after birth. Uh, the majority of parents we talked to said had learned in much more informal ways. Um, that's, you know, they, they had learned about parenting from um, seeing siblings raised from their parents uh, through on-the-job training with their own kids. And when we asked what they thought was the best time to learn child care skills, um, the majority said during school, either elementary, middle, or high school. 
Uh, about one in four, 26% said the best time was during pregnancy, so when you are expecting a child. And 17% thought the best time was after the child was born. We also asked parents about various activities they did with their child in the week preceding the survey. And just to kind of orient you to this graph a little bit, the blue bars are parents who said they had done this on all seven days during the preceding week. And the green are parents who said, I've done that um, five or six days during the preceding week. So 80% of parents said they had spent at least 20 minutes talking with their child on all seven days during the previous week. Uh, where's my green arrow? There it is. So that's this bar right here. And an additional 7%, they'd done that um, five or six days, so most of the time during the previous week. There were only 2% of parents who said they hadn't spent 20 minutes talking with their child on any days during the past week. So that seemed like a positive thing. Um, next, we asked about if you made your child responsible for completing a household chore. And 67% of parents said they made their child be responsible for completing a household chore on at least five days during the previous week. A uh, fairly similar number, 65% said they had eaten together as a family with their child on at least five days in the past week. Just over half had watched television with their child on five or more days per week. So watching TV is a pretty common way to interact with your child, uh, which is quite a contrast to the 33% of parents who had been physically active with their child um, by exercising, playing a sport, or other physical activity or game with their child. So that could be you know, tag in the backyard, throwing a ball around, anything of that nature. Um, about one in five, 19% of our parents said they hadn't done anything physically active with their child on any days during the preceding week. And the pattern was quite similar for non-physical games. So if that was a board game or cards or um, doing something else, that isn't running around in the backyard per se. 32% had done that on five or more days per week, and 23% said they hadn't played a game at all with their child in the previous week. This last column is kind of squished. You can't see it very well. Um, but we asked about attending a game or event that their child had participated in during the past week. And this was pretty low. 1% said they did this on seven days during the past week. 4% said they did it um, five or more days per week. Obviously, you know, Timmy's not going to have a softball game or every day necessarily, or you, know, you may go to a soccer game once a week. And this may actually be a function of the timing of our survey because we conducted this poll during the summer. Um, kids aren't in school, so there may be um, less recitals or things of that nature going on. Um, we just can't really know from that data, but I wanted to share it with you just the same. We also talked a little bit about family values. We wanted to know how parents were communicating their family's values about key health issues with their children. Um, so we quite deliberately didn't ask um, what the messaging was, just if their family's views were something that they shared with their child. And for parents with kids over five, we asked a set of questions. Um, we felt that you know, if your child is really super little, maybe there's some things that are just a little bit more complicated that you wouldn't have discussed with them as often. But once they're five, 81% um, of parents said they talk to their child, quote, often or, quote, all the time about healthy eating. Um, and this is a reference to the past year. Just 2% of parents said they hadn't discussed this at all with their child. 74% um, said they talk to their child often or all the time about physical activity. Uh, interestingly, when we asked about substance use, the majority of parents said they had talked to their child um, about their views on smoking or tobacco often or all the time, and that was 53% of parents said they talked about smoking and tobacco. Um, about 1 in 10, 11% of parents said they had never discussed smoking or tobacco use with their child in the preceding year. So whether the message is we don't ever want to see you smoking, or smoking is just for grown-ups, or um, you know, hey, smoking's great; it puts food on our table. Whatever, whatever that family's belief was about tobacco, 
they weren't necessarily communicating it to their children um, in 11% of households. We also saw that less than half of parents, 49%, said they had talked to their child often or all the time about their views on alcohol use. And nearly two in 10, now we're back to data I actually gave you on the slide, 17% said they had never discussed drinking with their child um, in the past year. So alcohol use isn't something that's coming up nearly as often as physical activity and healthy eating. We also asked some questions in the same framework, just appearance, just appearance of older children. So if your child was 10 or older, we asked questions on the preceding slide. They heard everything that we just talked about in the preceding slide. And also how often in the past year they had shared their beliefs, good or bad, with their child about a few more um, mature topics, if you will. 39% of Kentucky parents said they had talked to their child about healthy dating relationships often or all the time. Um, about one in four, 24% of our parents had never talked to their child about what a healthy dating relationship looked like in the course of the past year. 41% of parents of older kids said they talked about abstinence with their child often or all the time. So abstinence was definitely a frequently discussed subject. Although, again, one in four, 24% of parents said they never talked about this with their child. Uh, birth control was definitely a less common topic of conversation. Just 22% of parents said they had discussed their views on birth control often or all the time with their child. And again, that can be whatever their views on birth control, that it's um, not the right choice, that it's against their, their beliefs, that it's an effective strategy to pre pre prevent disease and pregnancy. Whatever their family believes about birth control, 43% of parents aren't sharing that with their children. So we also asked parents what they thought their child should be learning about various health topics in schools. And I, I apologize, this is kind of, I had to give you a picture for this one because it's kind of a convoluted slide, so bear with me a little bit. Um, we asked about various topics and whether or not parents thought they should be taught in high school. Um, and even regardless of how old your child was, did you think that high school students should be learning about this subject? So that even if, you know, Timmy is only in the third grade, did you want him to learn this when he got into the ninth grade? And the blue bars here are parents who strongly agreed that these topics should be covered. And the green bars are parents who somewhat agreed that these topics should be covered. People who actively opposed this are not pictured on these particular slides. Um, communication is a very popular topic. Um, that was one that parents strongly wanted to see communication skills addressed in the high school curriculum. Um, HIV and STIs, um, learning about sexually transmitted infections and how um, those are transmitted. Again, it's a subject that most parents, um, 95 plus percent, I failed to write that down and I don't want to do the addition wrong for you guys, um, wanted to see this covered in school. And again, you see it's very high for all of these subjects. Um, talking about human anatomy, talking about abstinence with children in high school, uh, talking about birth control, it gets a little bit lower, but you can see it's still in the upper 80s. Talking about condom use specifically, again, in the upper 80s, and sexual orientation and gender identity issues. Again, more than 70% of parents wanted that, that material covered in a high school curriculum. We asked exactly the same questions, but about middle school. So just to kind of get a feel for when parents thought these subjects, subjects should be covered. And just what I want to point out is that you can see the top of the bar here for all subjects is over 60%. So the, a solid majority of parents agreed that these topics should be covered in middle school. Um, and pretty much with everything except communication skills, they took a little dip. Um, some parents felt it was more appropriate for, to cover these subjects in high school. But in general, all par the majority of all parents believe these subjects should be covered in middle school as well. I'll just kind of give you a teaser of some of the other subjects we talked about. I'm not going to show you 964 bar charts just because you'd all probably hang up on me by then. Um, but we did also ask parents if their child was getting enough sleep because we know sleep is an important health issue. 
uh, both for safety reasons and just for the, uh, the child's ability to learn and function and go to school and do what they need to do. We asked specifically about PE class and if their child went to PE class and how often they were attending physical education programs at their school. We talked about some access to care issues. Um, did they have a medical home? Did they have, um, and did they receive respectful care at that medical home? Did the parent feel comfortable asking questions of their child's provider? Um, did they feel that their views and their family values were respected by that provider? We asked about the school dropout age. Um, the time that we were fielding this survey, this was a very important policy issue. A lot of um, coverage was going around, should there be a state law to increase the school dropout age from 16 to 18? Uh, that's kind of actually a controversial practice of, relative to the effectiveness of it, but obviously educational attainment, um, I think I'm preaching to the choir here on the phone, is a social determinant of health factor, and we know that um, it's definitely related to health, so we felt that was an appropriate thing to cover. A spoiler alert, parents, parents want their kids to <laughs> stay in school, so there was a, a lot of support for increasing the dropout age among parents. And there's more. That's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. I hope that um, I've kind of given you a little bit of a teaser, but there's a lot more data. I didn't want to just give you 900 bajillion facts here in our conversation. But as discussed, I wanted to talk a little bit about how you can dig deeper, how you can find out more about what was in the survey. This is how we reported this, the findings from the Kentucky Parent Survey. It came out in a series of um, issue briefs around um, various themes. The first one was on school policies and practices, health care access and quality, um, kind of children's behavior and family routines, parenting practices and where parents get information from. And then we issued the complete report for the series, which is this uh, blue document that's available on our website. And it gets more into the demographics and other details as well of the survey. So you can check that out if you're interested. And we're also really open to future research and doing more with this data. We think it's a pretty big, um, pretty powerful data set and we'd, we'd like to see it used. As with our Kentucky Health Issues Poll, we have posted this data on the OASIS Data Archive. So it is all public use data if you work with students who needed to do research projects, if you were, you know, your interest was piqued, if there's a set of questions that pertains to your work that you wanted to learn more about, you can actually access the full data set and do further analysis yourself. We, we readily encourage that. Um, just to protect privacy, there's a couple of location type fields that get suppressed when we do that because um, we don't want to, you know, not be respectful of the people who provided us with the data in the first place, but we also want to make it really useful to researchers, so we provide that. And shamelessly, this was the first Kentucky Parent Survey. It is not going to be the last Kentucky Parent Survey. We've committed to repeating this every couple of years. We're expecting to do it every third year right now. Um, we haven't fully hammered out the timeline, but if you have an idea for the next survey, tell us. Um, shoot me an email. Um, you can look it up on our website. Contact the foundation. Let us know what you think we should be asking parents because we want this information to be useful for your programs, for your grant applications, um, for the work that you're doing on the ground in the state. Um, that's, that's our primary objective. So we're always open to adding questions that people volunteer. And with that, we've got a fair bit of time for questions. I, if anybody wanted to send something in through your through the chat feature, I'm happy to take any questions now or, um, yeah, follow up. I'll just be quiet for a second if anyone's typing. This is one of those moments when I think that yeah, I should play the Jeopardy theme song because it's very weird that I'm talking right now and I can't hear any of you responding. So. The deafening silence in my office. I'm not gonna, not gonna lie. Oh, 
Well, all right. It looks like I may have completely overwhelmed you all with, question, with um, data and bullet points. So if you don't have further questions, um, I will shamelessly plug, please watch your email. You should be getting a message from us tomorrow with a link to an evaluation. Because this is the first time that we have done the Go to the Source series, we really want to hear your reviews and your thoughts on what was useful about these webinars, um, how we can do it better in the future. So please give us your feedback. Let us know what you think. Um, and from that, hopefully I will see many of you next week on our call about the Kids Count Data Center. Thanks so much, everybody. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your line.